Loch Ness, Scotland, 22 miles long, almost a mile wide, and an incredible 754 feet deep. Loch is the Scottish word for lake. By volume, Loch Ness is the largest lake in the British Isles. Many believe the loch is a haven for aquatic dinosaurs, lone survivors of the great dinosaur extinction 65 million years ago. There has never been any shortage of eyewitness sightings offering evidence that the monster or monsters exist. Diver Robert Badger. It was roughly six feet from top to bottom and it was cylindrical. I only looked at it for a second or two, realized what it had to be um, and surfaced as quickly as I could. Lockside resident Val Moffat. It must have been about 10 meters in length, very dark in color. Hotelier David Munro. I'm quite convinced that what we did see was a living creature of some description. Since the 1930s, there have been an average of 13 sightings a year. Along with countless photographs and films, capturing suspicious shapes and unexplained speeding wakes in the loch. Now, detailed scientific analysis sheds new light on images of Nessie. This world-famous photograph from 1934, this picture from a quarter of a century later, and this film from the 1960s. New scientific theories could explain many of the reported sightings. And cameras can now go where no cameras have gone before. Naked Science seeks to find out what is really going on in the depths of Loch Ness. The Loch Ness Monster may have first been seen more than a thousand years ago in 565 AD. The missionary Saint Columba supposedly confronted a monster that attacked one of his followers in the loch. He cried out, Thou shalt go no further, nor touch the man. Go back with all speed. And the monster fled from the scene. Myth expert Miranda Aldhouse Green believes a real incident could have started the legend. Most of the myths associated with the monster have some kind of grounding in reality. So these early Christian writers were probably seizing upon something that they'd heard about a large fish in the water or some commotion or uh, something like that in the water and embroidered that. It was centuries before the Loch Ness monster resurfaced. In the early 1930s, there were a series of dramatic sightings. On May 2nd, 1933, two local hoteliers reported a whale-like creature in the loch to the local newspaper, the Inverness Courier. Two and a half months later, on July 22nd, vacationers George Spicer and his wife believed they saw a creature crossing the loch's south road. It was just 50 yards in front of their car. The story spread like wildfire, and an army of journalists descended on the loch. Sightings continued, and within a year, an image of Nessie was captured in what became known as the surgeon's photo. So called because it was supposedly taken by respected surgeon Robert Wilson. Coming from so professional a man, with such unimpeachable credentials, the startling photograph had to be true. It established the Loch Ness Monster as a worldwide phenomenon. The picture clearly showed the head and neck of a creature emerging from the waters of Loch Ness. It fueled speculation that Nessie, as she quickly became known, was a prehistoric creature, perhaps the long extinct plesiosaur, a huge aquatic dinosaur that could reach up to 35 feet in length. Enthusiasts of the legend now had what they believed was a rock-solid piece of evidence. Over the next 50 years, other photos came to light, but nothing was as convincing. 
Then in the early 1970s, an American Academy of Science expedition produced some specialist underwater photographs that shook the scientific establishment. First came the flipper, then a body and neck, and finally the gargoyle head. Many believers were won over by these images, despite doubts in some quarters. Science needed more evidence before rewriting the history books. Adrian Shine, skeptic and leader of a British team called the Loch Ness Project, has spent 30 years trying to find rational explanations for the monster sightings. He went back to basics by posing simple scientific questions about the biology and environment of Loch Ness. Was there enough food in the loch in terms of fish to support large animals? What were the temperatures telling us? What was the environment itself telling us about what people were seeing? Shine didn't search for a 30-foot prehistoric survivor. He looked for creatures just a one-hundredth of an inch in diameter. Zooplankton. A monster brood hiding out in the loch would need plenty of zooplankton to support plenty of fish, which in turn could support large creatures. No food chain, no Loch Ness Monster. The depth to which sunlight travels down into the water offers a simple method of estimating the extent of the food chain. David Martin, freshwater zoologist, uses a white plate, known as a seshi disk, to test how far light penetrates into the water. We're going to lose sight of it slowly, and then I pull it up. Talking no more than one, two, three meters, nine feet of water. So nine to 10 feet, we lose clarity. Suspended brown peat washed into the loch from surrounding rivers prevents light from penetrating more deeply. Green algae, the bottom rung of the food chain, do not thrive in such low-light conditions. Minimal algae means that there is little food for the microscopic zooplankton to eat. This in turn means less food for small fish and thus less food for any large predators. Nessie can't be the only one of its kind. The monster population must be large enough to breed generation to generation. But researchers have calculated that no more than 17 to 24 tons of fish live in the loch. That's surprisingly few for a lake this size. And probably only just enough to keep around 10 500 pound creatures alive. Plesiosaur expert Richard Forrest believes that would be too few animals to sustain a breeding colony. 30 to 40 would be the minimum size of a sustainable breeding population. What's more, plesiosaurs would be easily spotted every day. Plesiosaurs breathe through their mouths and would need to surface in the loch every few hours. An air-breathing animal living in Loch Ness would be coming up to the surface all the time. And if there was a population of plesiosaurs there, you would go there any day. And if you watched the loch, you'd see many sightings, because each one would have to come up for air several times during the day. But coming up for air doesn't mean they can thrust their heads and necks high out of the water, as reported by some witnesses. The simple fact is that plesiosaur head can't do that, because the neck is too stiff. The bones of the neck interlock, and there are tall spines on top of them so that the neck can't go straight out of the water. The case for Nessie being a plesiosaur looks very shaky. But can hundreds of eyewitnesses all be wrong? Might there be enough food to support some other species? Perhaps a freak gigantic fish or a large undiscovered monstrous reptile in the loch? There's only one place to uncover the truth. Naked science dives deep into the murky, mysterious waters of Loch Ness. As deep as any camera has ever gone before, down to the very bottom. 
to Nessie's lair. There's one big problem for those who believe a prehistoric monster lives in Loch Ness. Extinct prehistoric creatures just don't pop up unexpectedly. Or so the experts thought. Until the day in 1938, when South African fishermen caught a monster fish believed extinct for 80 million years. This is a coelacanth fish, which swam in our oceans 360 million years ago. It's so old, it could be related to the first creatures that walked on land. Its pectoral and pelvic fins even have arm and leg-like movements. The Natural History Museum in London preserves a large number of fish species. Curator Oliver Crimmen looks after this exotic collection, which includes a coelacanth. It's equivalent to finding a dinosaur alive, perhaps. There was some, no, no reason to believe that coelacanths were still on Earth. It's a poor candidate to be the Loch Ness Monster, but its discovery gave heart to monster hunters. It was proof that supposedly extinct creatures can occasionally prove science wrong. Loch Ness is a far smaller area to search than the ocean that hid the coelacanth, but the black peaty waters hindered any investigation by divers during the early years. Monster hunters had to be content with film and photography from above the surface. But the arrival of sonar changed all of that. Sound waves opened a new and clearer window onto this murky world. As you can see, we don't have many fish. This is typical of Loch Ness. Surely, if there are some unknown giant creatures hiding in the loch, then sonar will provide the evidence we're looking for. But sonar does have limitations. Its range is relatively short, and rather like shining a giant flashlight into the loch, only creatures crossing the beam would be visible. With 263 billion cubic feet of water to search, the task is daunting. But that hasn't stopped many sonar expeditions trying to solve the mystery. The biggest was Operation Deep Scan in 1987. It deployed boats across the entire width of the loch. Each boat was fitted with sonar to give them the most comprehensive sonar sweep ever conducted on the loch. They soon made an exciting discovery which made headline news. The team of scientists said tonight they'd made sonar contact with a large unidentified object. They described it as of unusual strength and size. Urged on by their find, Operation Deep Scan returned to the same spot. Could they at last have found real evidence? They rescanned the area but eventually discovered that the reading came from debris on the floor of the loch. Their hopes were all but dashed, although three large sonar images remained unexplained. Adrian Schein, the leader of Deep Scan, is still a skeptic. We've wondered whether they could have been seals. Seals get into the loch. They were of about that magnitude. Of course, the fact that I don't understand a sonar contact doesn't mean it's a Loch Ness monster. The biggest sonar sweep on the loch failed to find any real evidence of large creatures. But still the sightings have continued. Could a monster be hiding where sonar cannot reach? Perhaps in a cave, deep down in the loch? There are myths that the loch hides what some have called Nessie's lair. A couple of years after the deep scan survey, a new discovery suggested that such a haven could indeed exist. Local boatman George Edwards used a digital echo sounder and spotted one rogue reading far deeper than Loch Ness's official depth of 754 feet. It's the deepest part of Loch Ness that's ever been recorded, 812 feet, which, as I say, is I found on the 1st of November 1989 when I was out here on a Coast Guard exercise. Might the 812 feet 50 feet more than previously recorded, 
be evidence of a cave where creatures could have evaded the deep scan sonar sweeps. We're getting roughly to the area now. As I say, I've seen, I've seen it a couple of times over the years, but it's very, very hard to pinpoint it exactly. As we circle, the lock gets deeper and deeper. Finally, the sonar hits 800 feet. Now that we have located it, Naked Science will send down a special underwater camera designed by the Loch Ness Project to investigate Nessie's lair. We're dropping the camera down the side wall and we're looking at the consistency of the, the wall of Urquhart Bay to see whether it, it could harbor the sort of folklore references to caves. After several minutes, the camera hits the bottom of the loch. Down here, it's normally pitch black and just above freezing. Right, find some caves. If not caves, maybe a shelf to hide from the sonar sweeps. Scattered rocks. Nice steep clay wall. Despite the myth of Nessie's lair, the bottom of the loch is very level. Not a cave or an indentation in sight. It's not surprising because the rocks here are extremely hard. The Great Glen Fault was created by tremendous heat and pressure during the collision of continents that formed Scotland millions of years ago. Loch Ness was then gouged into today's U-shaped valley by a series of glaciers. The last melted 11,000 years ago. Geologist Stuart Monroe is an expert on Scotland's topography. If we'd been around here about 11,000 years ago, we'd have been seeing a, a glacier that was retreating. But if the freshwater loch was not formed until just 10,000 years ago, then how could a population of prehistoric monsters have been living there for 65 million years? Could the monster possibly have come in from the sea after the end of the Ice Age? There is evidence of a massive flood around this time. Could it have washed Nessie into the loch from the sea and left it stranded when floodwaters retreated? A flood came from here, a valley named Glenroy, 20 miles south of Loch Ness. These ancient shoreline markings prove it was once full of water. A glacier acted as a natural dam, holding the water in until the day the ice melted. You know, normally in geology, we talk about events taking place over millions of years. This is the sort of event that would have happened one wet Wednesday afternoon. The equivalent of a third of the volume of Loch Ness itself came from Glen Roy, washing right over Loch Ness and rushing on to the sea at a point where the city of Inverness now stands. The flooding of this narrow strip of land between Loch Ness and the sea could have allowed Nessie and her brood to swim in from the ocean and make the loch their new home. Hypothetically, it's possible. But did it happen? In 1994, researchers took core samples of the mud at the bottom of the loch. These cross sections of layer upon layer of sediment provided an amazing record of the last 10,000 years. Revealing climatic change, acid rain, and even the effects of the Chernobyl nuclear accident. But it showed no evidence at all of any salt water entering Loch Ness since the last ice age 10,000 years ago. There's still no convincing evidence that um, the sea has been in after the last ice age. No sign of salt water means it's impossible that creatures could have entered from the ocean during a flood. And the only other way in is at the other end of the loch up the wide but shallow River Ness. That's the way that salmon, the occasional seal, and some more unusual creatures reach the loch these days. In 1932, 
a Miss McDonald saw a crocodile-like creature swimming in the river. It had a short neck, long snout, and possibly even tusks. Her sighting led naturalist Adrian Shine to propose an astonishing solution for the mystery. He suggested the monster could be this mammoth 10-foot long creature. Adrian Shine, a well-known Loch Ness investigator, believes some of the monster sightings may have been an enormous fish, such as the Baltic sturgeon. Oliver Crimmen, fish expert at London's Natural History Museum, has a preserved giant sturgeon. Here's the head of a very large sturgeon. To give you an idea of the proportions, this one would have been over 10 feet long. Of the potential candidates for a Loch Ness Monster, I think the sturgeon is probably the best. An occasional visitor to the UK, a monstrous fish with a corrugated dorsal profile, has these bony plates, and many of the, the sightings cite some sort of corrugated upper surface. Records show that sturgeons do sometimes travel along Scotland's coast. In 1871, a huge sturgeon was caught by a fisherman near the entrance to the River Ness that feeds the loch. But Shine now believes that these monster fish are not the total answer. Sturgeons are slow swimming fish. They could not be the cause of the many unexplained speeding wakes seen on the loch. Independent Nessie researcher Steve Feltham and this thing just went straight back through against the waves as if a torpedo went through there. But there are possible scientific explanations for these. Boat turbulence tends to remain on the surface of the water for some time. Ships pass out of sight quickly due to the narrowness of the loch, giving their wakes a life of their own. And once a wake is up and running, the combination of shadows from the surrounding steep hills and the dark lake waters can all too easily create monster-like shapes. And yet, there is one film of a wake on the loch that has confounded skeptics for over 40 years. The so-called Dinsdale film, named after the man who took it, is still regarded by some as the best film evidence of a prehistoric monster in the loch. Inspired by the legend, Tim Dinsdale, a young English aeronautical engineer, arrived at the loch on the morning of April 23, 1960, armed with a 16mm film camera. As he drove along the loch, Dinsdale saw an object speeding through the water. He studied it through binoculars and was convinced it was a monstrous creature powering along the surface. I saw the back there. It's the back of a very big animal, a huge thing. Dinsdale captured its speeding wake on his movie camera. This short burst of film became a compelling part of the Loch Ness legend. It was considered so puzzling that it was even analyzed by the Joint Air Reconnaissance Intelligence Center, or JARIC, Britain's foremost photographic experts. The report concluded it was probably animate, in other words, not a man-made object. The report from such an authoritative source ensured the Dinsdale film a place in Loch Ness mythology. But there is a puzzle surrounding the film. A minute white spot appears on the picture. Monster fans dismiss it as simply a fault on the original celluloid film perhaps a surface grain of dust as the film was developed. The skeptics, like the Loch Ness Project, who first identified the spot on a modern computer, claim the footage is not evidence of a monster in the loch. We tracked down one of the men involved in the original 1966 government analysis. David Oxley will attempt to resolve this 40-year dispute once and for all with the power of modern technology. Is the object in the Dinsdale film really indisputable evidence of the Loch Ness Monster? For the detailed analysis, 
he has recruited forensic image analysts Jackie Pastel and Terry Foley. The team concentrates on the sequence where the would-be monster travels right across the loch. Foley begins by inputting the film, now on videotape, into his computer, improving the contrast and enlarging the image. He then isolates several individual frames from different parts of the film. Jackie Pastel examines them through a stereoscopic device that merges two frames together. If the tiny white speck is a fault in the film grain, it will appear in only one of the frames. If it's a real component of the object speeding through the loch, it should show up on both frames. And that would make it stand out from the background in a 3D effect created within the stereoscopic viewer. This light tone is apparent on more than one frame of imagery and it's apparent on the two frames that we selected. Four decades after this film first caused a sensation, computer analysis finally proves that the white fleck cannot be a film fault. And if it's not a fleck of film grain, it perhaps leaves just one answer. And this leads me to the, the opinion that I'm looking at something that is actually there all the time. And the only thing that would be there all the time would be a helmsman. It would be the person actually steering this small boat across the loch. So after 40 years, has one of the key men involved in the original analysis changed his mind? It's my opinion that the object is inanimate and in fact is much more consistent with the shape of a boat uh, than perhaps it is of the Loch Ness Monster. The much-respected Dinsdale did in fact shoot a second piece of film, this time of a boat as a comparison, which can be clearly seen here. I think it's true to say that I couldn't put my hand on my heart and say 100% whether it's uh, a creature, a natural object, uh, or a boat being driven away from me. I could not do that. However, what I can say is my opinion. My opinion is simply that it has the appearance of a small boat being driven from one side of the lock to the other in the far distance. It took 40 years to solve this mystery, and science is constantly re-examining other evidence of the monster's existence. New studies are uncovering the truth behind this 1955 image of Nessie's hump, and the real story behind the most famous of all images of the Loch Ness Monster, the surgeon's photo. Modern-day investigations are at last uncovering the real stories behind two of the most famous pictures of the Loch Ness Monster. Dick Rayner is one of the Loch Ness amateur detectives seeking the truth about the legend. Rayner was just 17 years old when he began his quest. He joined up with a team of monster hunters calling themselves the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau. For years, Rayner believed he had caught the monster on film. This footage apparently shows it powering through the waters of the loch. But his dream was shattered 14 years later, when he saw a similar wake on the water. I could see, because it was only 100 yards away, that it was actually a family of mergansers, with a mother bird and seven or eight chicks running along the surface and then slowing down. These flying ducks shattered Dick's faith in the legend. He decided to prove that many so-called sightings are nothing more than the activities of local birds, animals, or boats. This telling bit of footage from Rayner's archive shows what appears to be a long humped back leading to a head and neck. But give it a few seconds and you realize it's a flock of birds on the loch. Determined to find out the truth, Rayner has spent 20 years examining some of the classic Nessie images. One of his key targets was this photograph of two large humps in the water. Bank manager Peter McNabb took this picture near Urquhart Castle in 1955. I noticed that there were 
two other lines in the water behind the one that the monster's traveling along. And when I join them up, I see that they, these lines are actually converging on a point. And that made me wonder if that's, these could be the waves left behind a boat. In this simple test, we place a camera on the same side of the loch where the McNabb photo was taken. From this viewpoint, we can see how wakes look after a boat has passed by. We move our boat toward the castle on the same trajectory as shown in the photograph. Within minutes, our wake bears a remarkable resemblance to the humps of a creature on the loch. The famous 1955 McNabb photograph may merely be the wake of a boat long gone from the picture. Our Loch Ness investigator has also examined more modern images of the monster in the loch. In 2000, Bobby Pollock, a postman from Scotland, was walking on a hill high above the loch when he saw something move hundreds of yards below in the water. His video camera captured a small black object moving erratically through the water. Could this be evidence of a monster? Pollock enjoyed a brief spell of fame after his video clip was widely shown on TV. But when Rayner analyzed the video in detail, he found what he believes is a vital clue. On the right side of the photo are what appears to be two canoes on the shore of the loch. Could the mystery object simply be one of the canoeists swimming, perhaps wearing a black wetsuit? One thing that makes me think it could be a swimmer is that there seems to be a hint of arm movements in, in some of the uh, bits of the film, as if someone's swimming along on their back. But one picture that's always been hard to explain away, at the very heart of the myth, the so-called surgeon's photo. The surgeon's photograph is the icon. It is what most people see as Nessie. It is their Nessie. It's instantaneously recognizable, but it, uh, there is still an enigma attached to it. In the 1930s, the surgeon's photo was a sensation. Not only did it seem to prove that Nessie existed, it came from an impeccable source, a much respected surgeon. Yet the true story of the picture is one of greed and deceit and a desire for revenge. In 1933, the seeds of deceit were sown when an English newspaper hired self-styled big game hunter Marmaduke Wetherill to hunt down the Loch Ness Monster. Within days, Wetherill claimed to be hot on its trail. He found monster-sized footprints on the shore of the loch. The Daily Mail newspaper announced his triumph to the world and late in 1933, casts of the footprints were sent to London's Natural History Museum for examination. Just a week later, however, the museum produced a damning verdict. They could find no difference between the monster footprints and those made by a hippopotamus. Wetherill had tried to fool the world by creating footprints with a silver hippo foot ashtray, a souvenir from his hunting days. Disgraced and bent on revenge, Wetherill returned to the loch with a model of a monster. Made from a toy submarine with a plastic dinosaur's head and neck, it was the handiwork of his stepson, Christian Sperling. He phoned up his son, his stepson Christian, and said, OK, if they want their monster, I'll give them their monster. Wetherill didn't just photograph the model on Loch Ness. He went a step further. His hippo foot hoax had ensured that nobody would believe him if he produced the new picture. So he persuaded Robert Wilson, a respected London-based surgeon, to join in the hoax. Wilson, who loved practical jokes, agreed to pretend to the press that he had taken the picture. The hoax was a runaway success, and the surgeon's photo was accepted as proof that Nessie existed. Amazingly, the real story remained a secret for 50 years. 
the true story of this hoax was known amongst small pockets of people, um, but it never got into the wider general public domain. But how did a two-foot-high model fool the world? Martin demonstrates by placing a similarly sized model in the loch. The photo that first appeared in the newspapers was cropped. The unedited version shows part of the shoreline, indicating that the model was placed near the shore itself. So we follow suit. But the original photograph shows a pattern of distinctive ripples. Now, we also have ripples. Martin is happy the conditions are similar and takes a photo. And with a bit of computer trickery, we can add grain and black and white. Side by side, the two photographs are very similar. It seems that the hoax was incredibly simple, but effective. A vital cornerstone of the legend has been exposed, and yet many seemingly mysterious sightings remain unexplained. A little known phenomenon in lake water physics a rare and unusual underwater wave may hold the key, at last, to unlocking the truth of the Loch Ness legend. Helen Ross, psychologist and expert on illusions, believes the myth is so powerful that people may see ordinary objects in the water, but fool themselves they are seeing the monster. When something really ambiguous is there, people often don't know, don't know what they're seeing and they can see all sorts of strange things. It's a bit like seeing faces in the fire or ink blots appearing as all sorts of creatures. Helen Ross is going to replicate an illusionary experiment conducted by the Loch Ness Project a few years ago, except with an added twist. We want to do the experiment in two places, both in Loch Ness and at Airthry Loch in Stirling University, in order to see if people respond differently in the two places. In both lochs, we are going to float a large wooden pole. The test will reveal if people turn this ordinary object into a monster sighting. We are then going to record the reaction of eyewitnesses with our cameras. Later, Helen will reveal the hoax and get the unsuspecting tourists to draw what they saw. People might begin to put their own imagination onto it and they might see it as a monster, particularly at Loch Ness. It's essential that the wooden pole doesn't have any monstrous features at all. It's important to have a simple object and not an, an actual fake monster so that we can see whether people embellish the object with their own imagination. As our first boat of the day turns up, we lie in wait for the unsuspecting tourists. They think our camera crew are here to film the bagpiper. Soon a crowd gathers to watch the piper play. In the background, our fake Nessie raises his head many times. At last, several people appear to spot something in the water. Helen goes in to question them. What do you think it is then? I think I saw Ness's kids' toys coming up and down the river, the lake. It's clearly that. Uh, some kind of uh, underwater machine, I don't know, a little submarine, I don't know. <laughs> Looks like Ness's breathing pipe. I think he's just come up to see what the noise is about. Our next tourist, a young boy, rushed down from the roadside after seeing our pole in the water. I thought I saw Nessie, but it turned out to be a log once I got a closer look. Ah, oh, but your first thought was that it was Nessie. I'm a firm believer in Nessie. And from that distance, he did think it was the monster, and he came running down to have a closer look, and then he saw that it was only a stick, and he was very disappointed. Most drew an object that resembled the pole, but the boy added a body to it. If, like our demonstration, one tourist out of ten embellishes a sighting. It can be seen how over many years this can add weight to accumulative evidence. It all comes down to expectations. Taking our fake Nessie to Stirling University will really test our hypothesis. The team set up near a bridge frequently used by our unsuspecting students. 
Down below in the water, we'll raise a smaller pole in keeping with the smaller size of the loch. Yeah, what do you see? Uh, I'm not sure what it is. Looks sort of like a stick. What is it? A stick, bobbing up and down. Um, it looks like a stick. Something popping up, like a stick or something? Such psychological demonstrations are never absolutely definitive. But it does show how people come to the loch with expectations that can affect how some perceive simple objects. It's not surprising that out of all the thousands of people who stand around trying to see something, one or two of them will be genuinely convinced that they have seen the monster. Skeptics such as the members of the Loch Ness Project believe that the unique topography of Loch Ness gives rise to some sightings. Loch Ness researcher Adrian Shine suggests there are two factors in creating illusions on the loch. First, the loch is like a wind tunnel because it's aligned with the prevailing southwest to northeast winds. Second, because of its great depth, the loch water never gets too warm in summer nor too cold in the winter. In fact, the loch never freezes. In winter, the relatively warm water meets colder air, producing unexpected mirages on the surface. And the winds of late summer, meeting the warmer, less dense top layer of the water, can induce an extraordinary process called a seiche. A seiche as demonstrated in this tank is created when the red upper warm layer mixes with the blue colder layer. This mixing process is kick-started by the wind to produce a rolling underwater wave driving the surface waters along the loch. This seesaw motion is almost invisible to the human eye as the warm layer passes over the cold water underneath. The top layer takes about 30 hours to travel the length of the loch. Once it reaches the far end, it bounces back this time traveling against the wind. Debris such as a log carried by the top layer of water will appear to swim against the wind. This unique footage clearly shows a log swept along in a seiche. So I might see an object on Loch Ness and think, oh, that's a log. And then I see that it's swimming into the wind. So I've rationalized that because it's moving against the wind, it's swimming, hence anima. Shine believes that sightings of logs and other debris moving in this apparently lifelike way trigger many false monster reports. Logs flow into the loch from six rivers and are pushed toward the center by an underwater current called the Langmuir circulation. The log is then in position to be picked up by the seiche as the wind begins to blow down the lake. But could people really mistake a moving log for a monster? One way of testing that theory is to drag a log through the water on the end of a rope. Many sightings mention humps, while others talk of heads and necks. For this test, Adrian Shine picks a log at random. In the right light, and with a chop on the water, our Loch Ness Monster is revealed in all its glory. Many modern eyewitness sightings may well be the result of animals swimming, boat wakes, large fish, or logs. Yet the legend has persisted for year after year. Dr. Luigi Picardi, an Italian specialist in Mediterranean geology, has developed another theory to explain some of the older sightings on the loch. He thinks they could have come from a more unusual source, earthquakes. Picardi believes that seismic activity could have laid the foundations 
of the legend of the Loch Ness Monster. He contends that seismic activity under a lake could produce a disturbance on the surface that could be mistaken for the monster. Picardy is currently investigating ancient Greek temples. He thinks that there is more to ancient mythology, Greek, Scottish or otherwise, than meets the eye. You find that many of the effects described in mythology can be related to real effects during strong earthquakes. Picardy believes his theories are not just applicable to ancient Mediterranean sites. They can also be linked to water legends. Some geologists believe that an earthquake in 1991 in Guatemala offers evidence to back up his theory. Scientists seeking evidence about the ancient Mayan civilization witnessed a local earthquake which produced a disturbance in a nearby lake. The seismic shock produced a wave formation with close similarities to serpent myths passed down in local legend. Picardy thinks that similar seismic activity could have caused sightings at Loch Ness. Loch Ness lies directly along the Great Glen fault line, created by the collisions of continents that formed Scotland 400 million years ago. However, the only record of earthquake-induced water disturbance happened over 200 years ago, when Loch Ness was rocked by a major earthquake. That quake was centered in Lisbon, Portugal, more than a thousand miles away. Reports state that uh, a wave about two or three feet in height was seen traveling up and down the loch. Roger Musson, principal seismologist at the British Geological Survey, is skeptical about the theory. Despite proof that tremors can cause commotion in the loch, Musson believes that there is too little activity in the area itself. One thing that one can say definitely is that whatever the cause of monster sightings in Loch Ness might be, earthquakes is definitely not it. Picardy disagrees and suggests that seismic activity around the town of Inverness, where the bridge has been earthquake-proofed because of recurrent tremors, could affect Loch Ness just 10 miles away. He plans a detailed seismic survey in search of evidence for his theory. Naked science has established that many sightings on the loch can be explained by natural phenomena. We have discovered that waves, birds, mammals such as seals, and large fish such as the Baltic sturgeon help prolong the myth. Underwater seiches could have made debris such as logs appear to be mysterious, large humped creatures. No bones or carcasses have ever been found. There seems to be an overwhelming case that Nessie is merely a myth, a legend kept alive by people anxious to believe that mysteries exist within our natural world. We have a wish to explore, we have a wish to find things that are unknown. We are attracted by mysteries. We are a very curious species. But maybe one day, the lock will reveal a monster species thought extinct, confounding science once again.